think we'll go ahead and get started. We've got three speakers tonight, so um, we want to get you out of here at a reasonable hour, so we'll start on time. Um, welcome to Sailor Series. I'm Allison Smart. Um, James is usually standing up here, but he's on a boondoggle in D.C. right now. So you'll have to deal with me instead. Um, just want to hit some administrative points before we get started. Um, we've got a good amount of folks here tonight, so if you would, just make sure you silence your cell phones. And also just want to let you know where the exits are. There is an emergency exit on this side of the room right over here, and also, of course, the, the main entrance on the right side of the room. Coming up at the museum, we've got three big events in the next couple of weeks. Uh, on April 26, which is next Friday, we have Arctic Visions, Away Then Floats the Ice Island, opening in the Waddles Family Gallery. It's going to be a phenomenal exhibit, and it's going to be a really cool opening. We've got all kinds of programs going on. We've got an ice sculptor on the plaza, live painting in the Jacobs Gallery, um, another photography exhibit opening upstairs. We've got performance art on the Lagoda, so it's going to be very cool. It starts at 5 o'clock, April 26th. Um, join us for that. should be a good time. Uh, two weeks from now, we have the conclusion of Sailor Series, and that will be a lecture with Ken Reed. Um, from Puma Racing, and he will be talking about the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, so if you haven't gotten your tickets for that, see the front desk. And then May 4th, we have um, the Azorian Maritime Heritage Society is doing their annual fundraiser. And at the same time, we will be opening the upgraded Azorian Whaleman Gallery. So that will include the beautiful wooden Azorian whaleboat model that you've all been admiring for the past hour. Um, and the tickets for that are $40, and you can reserve those tickets at the front desk. Um, just want to recognize a couple of people here tonight. We've got Carl Beckman. C.E. Beckman is the sponsor of Sailor Series, so thanks a lot, Carl. Appreciate it. We have, uh, hopefully some of you got up to see the Model Boat Show, uh, which is open, and we will keep that gallery open for about 20 minutes after the lecture tonight. So if you haven't had a chance to look at it, uh, now would be a good time. Judy Lund is working on a catalog for, that, uh, for our model collection, and that'll be released in June which is exciting, and we have the Firkenhoffs here tonight, Marilyn and David, and they're generously supporting that, so thanks, guys, for that. So as I mentioned, we have three speakers tonight. I think what we'll do is leave the question and answer period for the end, and we'll have all three speakers up here, and you can feel free to ask any of them questions. So we'll just move through the three speakers and then do questions at the end. So our first speaker tonight is going to be discussing the uh, Azorian uh, whaleboat model that you've all been looking at throughout the cocktail hour. Joe Suarez will be speaking to us, and he is speaking to us because our shipwright, uh, Joao Tavares, uh, his English is just about as good as my Portuguese, meaning he actually doesn't speak any. So, um, so Joe, it, his leadership was absolutely instrumental in getting Joao here to the States to build this model for us. Um, he is the owner of uh, Bay State Drywall, and he also is contributing his own, uh, another item to the upgraded Azorian exhibit, which will be a Vigia, which is a whale spotting station that are prevalent in the Azores. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joe Suarez. Thank you. Um, I would like to consider myself more as of a translator than, than a speaker, you know? But I bring John up so um, everyone can see and recognize John Tavares. He's the master boat builder 
um, that came here from the Azores. Just on my part, I'm just proud to be uh, part of uh, this, this project. And uh, on John's behalf, you also have an instrumental crew that's been giving him a hand as far on the construction of the half-size um, Azure whale boat. Uh, you would like to thank and recognize those people that have been working along with him. One of them is Paul Bradley. Paul, please stand up. Okay, yes everyone. <laughs> Paul is a fine craftsman, okay. Uh, Peter Silva. <laughs> Peter Silva is a naval architect, okay, and is also, when you heard about the project, uh, it's just something that he couldn't pass up. He's been here, been instrumental, been a great help. Thank you. Fernand Viveros. He does a lot of the, the small stuff, the melon spike and so on. Um, along with uh, John Branco, is John here? John Branco, Manny Garcia, and Philippe, which is an apprentice uh, here from the Azores. He came here on a grant from the government of the Azores. Um, he's uh, on an apprenticeship program with John Tavares. Okay. Now to talk a little bit more about the boat, uh, some, some people ask to see drawings. Basically, the model, the drawing, that the Azurian half-size wheel boat is a mock-up that John does like this. And actually, if you can see, it's built in layers. It's separated right now, okay? But they do a 120th scale of a model that they're trying to build and then in different sections so they can pull them apart and they measure to the millimeter as far as dimensions. Of course, John basically knows all this by heart. Uh, he takes a sheet of plywood and he starts drawing and he comes up, he draws the stems, uh, uh, that the model uh, shapes, uh, he pretty much knows all that. But this is a model, a mock-up that he builds for uh, the half size whale boat. So what you see, we're talking about a half size. It is a half size of a typical Azurian whale boat, what you see uh, on Jacob's Jape, Jape gallery. So um, without any further delay, we'll, uh, we'll go through um, some uh, pictures of, um, of the building of the boat. So as most of you can see this is the startup laying up with the keel and, um, and the stems. To advance this forward. Okay, on this section, John has the molds. He, he had pre-cut all the molds, so he's setting all the molds, uh, molds in. There's uh, Fernando giving a hand. Now, they're starting up. Usually you start up with two, uh, two planks from bottom up and two planks top down, which is gives uh, the band. Um, so here they try to round, round the boards into, uh, into, the, into the shapes. As you can see already, you know, um, they're building some boards, yes. Okay, next picture please. Um, as you can see, they're starting to, you know, nail through. All uh, the fastness is riveted. Normally, it's, um, it's a square copper nail, uh, and everything is uh, uh, fastened with the roof and riveted. So they're trying to um, rivet in to the battens. Okay. Once he pre-cuts the boards, he shapes it to size. Uh, the idea is to catch, there's a batten on the interior to catch both boards. Now this picture of uh, the stern, the stern of the boat. Now this is Philippe, the, the apprentice that we have from the Azores. And uh, Peter did all the fine work on the, on the, the rudder handle, okay, he did um, Peter did pretty much uh, the loggerhead, 
all the small stuff, the fine work on the handle, the rudder itself. This uh, John filing away must have been when he spliced two, two pieces of the baton, so he's smoothing it out. And this is already working the thwarts on the seats, and uh, I believe Paul is uh, setting uh, the step. Actually, uh, the round part that you see at his left hand, it hinges up. When you're trying to set up the mast, you slide it through about a foot and a half, and that will hinge as the mast is going up, that will hinge to get the mast up. And already they're discussing the finishing touches pretty much at the end of uh, construction. You can see we have most of the thwarts, most of the, the pieces already in place. Very good. Um, as, um, as I was saying at the introduction, uh, I've just been pleased to be involved with this project and uh, to know John. Uh, we practically grew up together. We grew up, you know, uh, about 300 feet from one another. Uh, so it's been a pleasure all these years. John have built one of these boats for myself. I have one that I race on the Azores pretty much uh, almost every, every, every Saturday in the summertime. It's just, uh, it's just fun. It's just a lot of admiration for John to see him, how he works. Uh, just from the years experience, the ease that he puts into his labor. Uh, but he also likes to come here. He already made some good friends, and he's talking about coming back. And a year from now, even if it's not a project, he wants to come back and visit most of you because he made some good friendship, friendships already. Okay, other than that, as Allison already mentioned, on behalf of the Azurian Maritime, um, which I should start by thanking all the people that contribute for this project, starting with uh, the, the Whaling Museum, the Azorian Maritime Heritage, friends uh, that have contributed to this project. We like to thank all those people that contributed in many ways. Uh, second, on May 4th, as Ellison already mentioned, we're gonna have a major fundraiser here at the museum. Um, and because later this year, we have in the seventh international whale boat regatta. Regatta, this is gonna happen from the 4th to the 10th of September of this year. And the events on the water will take place on the 6th, the 7th, and the 8th of September. Of course, uh, leading up to that, we're gonna host two teams from the Azores. So there'll be three racing teams, one from New Bedford, from the Azorean Maritime Heritage Society and Friends, and two teams from the Azores, from Fayal and Pico, that are coming over. Uh, and we'll have those beautiful races. Also, for the first time, as I understand, uh, there will be a sail on Sunday with three Yankee whale boats and three Azor and whale boats. And that will be, that will be fun to see. I'm also encouraged and love to, like to see that. So, and for, to raise funds for these events, please, all of you that come, um, I invite you to come down on uh, May 4th uh, for the main event. And I think it's all for me. Thank you all. Thanks, Joe. Um, this whale boat has been such a labor of love for so many people, and it's been very fun going into the boathouse every day and seeing Peter Sylvia, who's just up from Pennsylvania to help out, and Paul Bradley, who's from Rochester, and Joao, who's from Pico, and um, it's, it's just a great way to get everyone together, so. Okay, so now on to the Yankee whale boat. Um, it's important that you have uh, get the intricacies and the differences between these two whale boats so you've got a good base of knowledge when you all see us um, in the Yankee whale boats getting our butts kicked by the Azorian whale boats during the regatta. <laughs> um, the Yankee team is going to start 
practicing in a couple of weeks. Barbara, I'm sure the Azorians have been out there all winter practicing. <laughs> Um, so uh, we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a really special event and we're grateful that Mystic is letting us have a little bit of fun with our whale boat before uh, she is tied to the Davits of the Morgan. So a little bit of background on how this whole Beetle whale boat project got started. When Mystic approached us regarding building a whale boat for the Morgan, it was a project that we simply couldn't say no to. <laughs> Uh, as many of you know, back in the 1920s and 30s, many members of the old Dartmouth Historical Society were instrumental in preserving the Morgan, Colonel Green of Round Hill, first among them. So for us, this was a once in a lifetime opportunity, and thankfully, many of our members agreed and stepped up in the same spirit of the old Dartmouth. Peter Kellogg kicked us off with a matching challenge, and since then, over 50 donors have contributed to the project. Now, don't get any ideas. We're still happily accepting donations, and we have pledge cards out uh, outside of the door when you uh, leave. So, um, once we accepted Mystic's challenge, there was only one call that we could make, and that was to Bill Womack and Charlie York at Beetle Link. Their enthusiasm for the project matched ours, and I don't think it was more than a week after that phone call before they got started. What a fantastic story this is. Historic whale boat builders turned internationally recognized boat builders go back to their roots and build an authentic wooden whale boat to swing off the davits of the last surviving wooden whale ship as she makes her historic 38th voyage back to her home port of New Bedford for a nine day visit in July 2014. Very cool. That said, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Bill Sauerbrey from Beetle Link. Bill is the lead boat builder at Beetle Boat Shop in Wareham, Massachusetts. His skills as, as a traditional wooden boat builder grew from a position documenting and building small craft with Barry Thomas at Mystic Seaport, and have been honed through the production work in the Beetle Cat Shop, as well as a variety of custom projects. His enjoyment of photography has allowed many to see into the process of these projects and the beauty of the craft. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Sauerbrei. Being a Yankee, I speak English, so I guess I gotta do this myself. Um, <laughs> but uh, a lot of my intro was just stolen from me, which I'm relieved. So. Uh, at any rate, if we go back, this is not a photo that I took. This is uh, the Beetle Boat Shop. Um, and I don't know what the date is, but obviously this is when, if you look in the back, there's three uh, Beetle whale boats. You sort of see one bow, two a side, two bows on a side. A um, couple new boats ready to go out. A beautiful build, Beetle built cat boat, probably. And a bunch of derelict, beat up whale boats in the foreground. And, uh, the, uh, we're upstairs in the, the Beetle Boat Shop here, um, and the Beetles were known for their production methods and how quickly they could produce a boat. Uh, so the upstairs was solely for the Beetle Boat, and before setting up to uh, assemble a whale boat, maybe the molds were set on the backbone like this, and all the other pieces would have been made ahead of time. All the planks would be cut out. They would have been steamed and warped to shape. All the frames would have been steamed and bent. And so the story has it that they could assemble a beetle whale boat with possibly six guys in 48 hours. Uh, that's assemble. Everyone says build. <laughs> um, we're very lucky to have photos like this. This is upstairs during the process. This boat needs one more plank. Uh, and this shot is a killer. Um, when you think of what these boats are built for and who's in them and, you know, what they do, uh, <laughs> humans are funny. They're beautiful. They're really gorgeous boats. And they have a quite a few interesting uh, intricacies about them. If you look at this boat here, you can see how, you can see by the shadows, a couple of the planks overlap one another. Some are smooth and underneath is another overlap. Originally these boats would have been built with all the planks 
overlapping. That's another view of it. I made these black and white just to kind of mesh in. This is the boat at Mystic, actually. I mean, that's sorry, Mystic, sorry, at Beetle. <laughs> this is the boat we're building at Beetle. So um, the, uh, the story had it that the lap strake boat spilt water off the, off the laps and was noisy. So I believe the Beetles were the first to do what we call batten seam construction. And that's why you can see the, the two rows of fasteners there, like throughout. Um, and so it essentially still acted like a lap strike boat with the planks overlapping one another. Um, you could build the boat with thin planking, build it lightly. It would keep the water out enough. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's the construction method. So at our shop, we had to start off by drawing out the boat full size. It's difficult to get a full size picture, but um, that's, that, that's just plywood painted out white with the, the full drawing on it called lofting. And from that, you can develop the shapes of things that you need. These are the shapes of the molds, which are then taken off the floor and cut to shape. And those are the stem and stern post steamed and bent to the shape that came off the lofting. And here we are carving the stem rabbit. This is very much the same as what, I mean, this, this could all go towards the boat that you just saw. You know, we just happened to take lots of photos as we went along. So I'm gonna zip through these, but they're, the two boats are very related in construction, but the, the shapes are very different. And there's some, some changes, but it's similar. Um, the, the keel has its rabbit carved in it. For the rabbit is the groove in which accepts the plankings, that, the plank that meets the backbone of the boat. This gives you something to fasten. So we saw Manny Palomo, who actually built the whole boat while I took pictures, was carving the, the stem rabbit here. And uh, I actually did the keel while he was doing the stem rabbits. But uh, I did some. But, uh, he was on it for the whole thing. I have to give him a lot of credit for what he did. But you can see from the lofting, we pick these up, and we assemble it together, sort of a different view, but you can see suddenly the, the last bit of fairing through to bring that rabbit in. And then this shows the thickness of the planking coming into it, and you can see how it's, there's a bevel that changes. So in the next picture, you can sort of see how the molds would come in at different bevels. You see how they would if the planking were sitting on it, um, each, each place would have a different, uh, different bevel for um, where the planking came in. So that was all figured from the lofting and then assembled. Um, then we uh, start, uh, we, we, the original shop, I should say, had a, a very low ceiling and they fastened everything up to the ceiling to give rigidity to the, the mold. We didn't, so we put a beam across our big warehouse in order to get that. That's what you see all those supports doing. Then uh, that's lining off. So we want, that's actually the first time that we see the boat three-dimensionally from after the lofting. So we, uh, we, we mark where all the planks are going to go. And then from there, that's a pattern. We're developing the shape of the plank called spiling. Two, you can see all the lines on the molds from uh, where we're going to fit our planks to. Um, so we spile the planks, and I love this shot. The, what happened in 1921, the last commercial whale boats were built, and the Beatles had a pile of lumber for building the Beetle whale boats, and that's when they switched to build the Beetle Cat. So in 1921, they started building the Beetle Cat, which is our bread and butter, that's what we're still doing today. So when we were asked to do the beetle whale boat, we just go right back into our sheds and pull out the same material to build the beetle whale boat. So there's a beetle cat in standard colors, of course, and uh, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> and, uh, and then we uh, run it through our, our bus planer from the turn of the century that we still have to bring it to the, the thickness. From there, we get out our planks. So when you have a lap strake, when the plank laps over uh, another, you have to um, put a certain bevel on it. That's the front end has a thing called a plank gain. That's what you're looking at there. Um, so 
the next plank is then spiled again. Obviously, if you were in production, you would have patterns for all this. We, we had to develop it as we went. Um, and then you get out the next plank, which has a specific shape coming from your spiling. And there it is. There's, that's the first overlap. You know, so you get that lap in there. You can see how the, the overlap fades at the ends. So when you look inside, I don't know if you can see, but where the rib, line of rivets are, there's, it, you can see it fades in to come, come flush. That was that weird cut you saw earlier. Um, and now that we're all on a roll and we got our lap straight going, we have to switch to the batten seam. So on, on our molds, we, we put a little filler piece here. And then we decide to get rid of it so we can put a batten in. And the batten slips in to that space there. And now you're able to spile and go on to the next plank. The next plank, um, let's look at the batten up forward. Oh, the battens are, are not full length, neither are the planks. There's scarf joints like that in everything. You'll see them in the plank as well later. That's just a scarf in the batten. That's inside the boat. But the next planks get steamed and what the beetles have always called wumped. And there's a box of wumpers in our shop labeled from way back in the day. And so these are, uh, these are wumpers that we made for the the whaleboat to cup the plank in shape. So you take it out of the steam box and quickly clamp it into its shape. And then the next day, you can hang that. That's one of those scarf joints that's going to be in the, the plank itself. And that's what it looks like when finished. The next one comes over it, and there's a little butt block through it. And there's no glue. There's no goo. There's nothing. It's just wood to wood fit, as there is with all the laps and battens. Everything's just beveled and fit. And uh, you heard about the rivets. You can see we're using some rivets here because we didn't have all the nails of the right length like the Beatles did. Um, our boat was built with clenched nails for the most part. But there's that's a close-up of that. You just let that feather edge stand proud by a 16th and face aft, you know. Um, so those rows of fastenings there are clenched nails rather than rivets. You just drive these. They, they had soft um, iron nails that they would use. And we're using copper. We can't get the iron. Um, but you just drive them. You drill a hole, and you drive them through into an iron. And they just bend right back around. I should have taken a photo of that. There's, you can see on the butt with those little blocks, you can see some rivets. The rest of those things are just clenched nails, all those little dots. And you can see the battens from the inside. And we're moving along, coming on up, still planking away. As we get to the turn of the village, there's more whumping, stronger whumping to do. Um, another view of one of those planks ready for the scarf butt there. And there she is with one more plank to go on. We're back to lap straight. We're, we're that overlapping again. We have one more to go. That's, the Beatles had, um, you know, that funny jog as a, what the, the forward rabbit that the planks are screwing into suddenly jogs forward. And the Beatles were the only ones to do that. So if you ever see a whaleboat, that top strake is painted and you can see that forward angle change on the boat. Um, it, it has a purpose, which I can maybe remember to tell you when I come up to it. But she's really, it's a beautiful thing to, 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 to see go together. We're getting to that point where I can sort of tell you, there's um, these big oak timbers went in. Those are um, on, this, on, the, on the top of the rail. It's called an in whale. And the, the, the top plank, or shear strake, which now goes into that rabbit, that, that shape actually spans the plank out a little bit, which makes it much easier to put in these bow chocks or cheek pieces. And here it's a little hard to see. I'll go to the first picture. You can, I mean, the, the last picture. That's, that's what the front of the whaleboat looks like when finished. Things will get rounded off and a little lead gets put in later. But that's essentially where the bow, where the, the, the line going to the whale, when you're being on your Nantucket sleigh ride, that's the line comes out of there. Um, 
through those those chucks. So, you know, once again, if I go back, you can see how that piece fastens to the the whale, and then it'll get riveted to the stem. That kind of holds the whole front of the boat together. It's very unique. Um, I love that picture. It's just a beautiful shape. And uh, at that point, the whole boat is held together by its own planking. So the molds were removed, and she was held with a few supports still, you know, keeping her width and everything. And she still fastened that strong back on the bottom that gave her a shape. All the frames were steamed and bent over this form that Mystic Seaport lent to us that I built 25 years ago while over there. <laughs> but the, uh, um, they're all bent to the same curve. Oops, wrong button. Um, and uh, put a few new toggles back on it. Uh, you'd bend the rib and just knock those toggles over. And I think we saw pictures of the original beetle mold that had something like that when we did that. And uh, that's what the rib looks like. It's a tapered rib, and it has a little bit of a foot on it. And now the trick is, when you bring it into the boat, you unbend it to fit to the boat. So it's freshly steamed, and you can't bend it anymore, but you can unbend it. And so you would unbend them and fit them in and scribe them. Manny will answer any questions you have about that, because he did all of them, not me. So. Uh, He's, he's here tonight with his parents, I believe. And um, the, the thing about it was it was a functional fitting. So wherever a fastener was to go through the boat to fasten to the rib, which would either be through a lap or through one of the battens, which are essentially lap as well, it needed to fit well. And it did not have to fit anywhere else. There's no reason to take any more material off. So as you can see, there's space behind it in places, and that's perfectly normal and it's functional. And those are all the ribs in there. So for a production boat, there's a lot of scribing and fitting. You know, it's, 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 it's surprising. And uh, at this point, we start putting some of the interior in. The, the, uh, the seat riser is going in here. The mass step is going in the uh, centerboard box. The centerboard box is tagged in temporarily. See that, um, those little tabs on the bottom of it? We can't get underneath to drive the fasteners through because we're still sitting on the strong back. And so the beetles had uh, these little tabs. You could tag that in uh, for the time being so you could put all your thwarts in, your seats and whatnot. Um, once again, more ceiling going in, more ceiling. Um, okay, the forts are in. <laughs> um, so uh, these are the seats that go across. And then these are the knees, the fort knees with filler pieces that add support. So the, the boat would get, you know, at sea, it would get lifted up on davits. It would bang into the hull of, of, of the whaling ship. And so these give a lot of strength. Those knees tie in that uh, in whale, in down to the fort. And, uh, and that piece in the middle, is, you can sort of see it's sandwiched. There's a piece of wood between those knees sitting on top of the thwart. And that was only done for wherever somebody was sitting. Otherwise, the, uh, the thwart would be rather uncomfortable. Um, as a matter of fact, that kind of shows it over there. You see how that piece of, of seat is there? And the one behind it doesn't have those filler pieces? That's because nobody would be sitting on the aft one. So wherever somebody was sitting in those filler pieces. Now this is a, a cool piece. This is the loggerhead. So the line came through the chalk from the whale and it went through everybody because they would act as a winch and then it would go around what we call the loggerhead which would take up and hold the tension and be able to work the, the line. So um, I don't believe that they used a lathe back then from the, from the shapes of them. And uh, if you look at the Azorian half boat, you'll see that it's very, um, very shapely. So there's some angles to it and whatnot. So it was cut square to shape. It was then cut to eight sides. And here it is on its lion's tongue, as we call it, the piece of wood that gives it its strength tied to the, the stern post. 
And then with a spoke shave, it's rounded by Manny. And then just sanded smooth. It's, it's a very aesthetic thing, so I took a few pictures of it. <laughs> it's, with the lion's tongue and everything back there, it's nice. It's a solid piece, by the way. That piece coming down through to the, the bottom of the ceiling down here, this, this is all part of that piece of wood. It's one piece. And there's a little key there to hold it. Um, another nice view of the lion's tongue coming down to it. Now we're on the forward end. Um, the, the notch here is called, and this whole piece with this notch for your knee is called a clumsy cleat. And uh, I guess the harpooner would have his knee put in there for stability. Um, up forward, oops, I keep pressing the wrong one. Um, up forward, you have the wrong picture. Oh, am I backwards? I am. What am I doing? Oh, I am, that's why. I'm holding it backwards, trying to turn on the laser. So, yeah. The, I think that's it, yeah. That's the warp box, they call it. That's where um, a lot of the line that would be ready for when you're harpooning to easily come out of the boat would, uh, would be stored. It's called the warp box. And uh, so you've got your knee in the clumsy cleat, you got uh, the line flies out of the warp box, and then you're on the beginnings of your Nantucket sleigh ride. Uh, very often the boat would get tossed around quite a bit. And if, for some reason, you'd be tipped over and the line popped out of your chalk and started sliding down here, it would get caught inside of this thumb cleat, which would keep from probably decapitating everybody on the boat, you know, but it'd still be rather exciting, I'm sure. Um, back aft, that, that piece there is the uh, outrigger for the steering oar. And the guy on the steering oar, if he needed more visibility, he could stand on these two chalks. See those pieces? He could stand high to get more visibility while still, and there's that, that steering uh, outrigger back there. Um, gosh, I should tell you how long that oar is. It's like 25 feet. It's like a very long, very long oar, I forget. Um, and then if he's really hauling off and trying to steer the boat around, he can put his foot under this foot brace here. This, which is, which is just a cutoff for one of those frames, nicely let in. Another view up forward, that's the, um, the hinged uh, mast partner for the, I guess we call it tabernacle mast, and the butt of the mast would slide down here and into the mast step. A nice view of the, the whole orlock and pad. And uh, when we go to haul the boat up in the Morgan, there's just two of these. They would have been iron. Uh, Mystic gave us these lovely bronze eyes that are bro weld bronze. And, uh, and those are riveted through the stems. And those two things will take the whole weight of the boat and gear when they haul it up. And this is, this is the stage that the whale boat's in right now. Um, we need to make the, the centerboard, the rudder. Um, I'll, show you where, I'll show you a few pictures of Manny making the rig in a second. Um, but we've moved off primarily to do a bunch of other things. We have two orders for some of these 14-foot cats that's in the foreground here and a bunch of beetle cat work and whatnot. In the background, Mystic lent us a whaleboat that Willits Ansel built um, back in the 90s, I believe. And, uh, Willis Ansel has written the whaleboat book. So if you have any questions, get your hands on that book. Um, just describes everything about it. I think they're about to republish it again, too. But Willis Ansel, the whaleboat book, he built that boat, and we were able to use that as a guide as well as uh, the, the lines drawings. And here's Manny taking a hunk of fur to, to, to cut out the mast, which was cut out square then eight-sided, and then rounded, just like the loggerhead, just a bit longer. And uh, there he is, just cleaning it up. And there is the rig, all oiled up and ready. So we still need to caulk and paint and make centerboard and rudder and that sort of stuff, but 
that's where she's at now. So. That's it. <laughs> And thank you for everyone who made it possible for the Beetle Boat Shop to have another Beetle Whale Boat Bill. It's been awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. That was great. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Dyer. I'm the Maritime Curator um, here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Uh, a couple of things before our last speaker takes the podium. Back in the early 1990s, when I first started working at the Kendall Whaling Museum, um, there were uh, some names that always seemed to come up in conversation. Oh, you want to talk to Nathan Lipford about that, or Dan Finnamore would be the best person to answer that question, or I'd ask Paul Sear. Um, but since 1995, the response has frequently been, I think that Quentin Snedeker would know the answer to that question. And as a preservation shipwright at Mystic Seaport Museum, Mr. Snedeker is in a way the equivalent of the curator in charge of the California condors at the San Diego Zoo. He's working to save the last of something and succeeding in the attempt. Which brings me to my second point, and that is this. The last time that a square-rigger, uh, square-rigged whaler sailed out of New Bedford was August of 1924, and it never returned. That was the bark wanderer that dragged its anchors in a gale and went onto the rocks at Sow and Pig's Reef off Cuddyhunk Island. In the summer of 2014, the world will see the Charles W. Morgan an actual New Bedford-built whaler of the 1840s sail back up the Akushnet River. Now, what kind of a moment is this for the maritime curator at the New Bedford Whaling Museum to stand at the podium in the New Bedford Whaling Museum and say, again, in the summer of 2014, the world will see the Charles W. Morgan, an actual New Bedford-built whaler of the 1840s sail back up the Akushnet River. <laughs> This spine-tingling moment will be in a large part due to the efforts of Mr. Quinton Snedeker. Snedeker, co-author of the definitive treatise on Chesapeake Bay schooners, led Mystic Seaport's effort to reproduce the schooner Amistad. He supervised the restoration of the 63-foot eastern rig dragger Roanne, the sandbagger Annie, the oyster boat Nellie, and the no-ank uh, no lobster boat Star. He is now director of the Henry B. DuPont Preservation Shipyard, currently restoring the 340-ton National Historic Landmark vessel Charles W. Morgan, and we, the members, staff, and volunteers of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, welcome him to the podium this evening. Quentin Snedeker. This works opposite to what logic would tell you, I understand. Well, thanks very much for um, inviting us here tonight. It's, uh, I really feel it's appropriate that we be here. Probably should have been here earlier, but uh, I know Matthew Stackpole, my co-worker, has been here before. Uh, it really will be a monumental uh, moment in maritime history when she comes back up the river here. Uh, I, would, uh, I was married for a while to a woman from New Bedford, and <laughs> the, uh, actually, I'd have gotten slapped for that because she's from Fairhaven. Uh -huh. But uh, first time I had dinner at the home, I had three strikes against me. Um, and the first was that I came from Mystic, and Mystic had stolen the Charles W. Morgan. <laughs> now, of course, those of us who know the story know that that's not quite how it happened. But to be able to bring her home uh, will be the fulfillment of quite a, a monumental effort on our part to restore the vessel in this, re in this particular regime of work, but the work that the museum, Mystic Seaport, has done since 1941 when she first arrived there. 
But uh, again, were it not for the work that went on here from 1924, 25, through at least the hurricane of 38, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it. So I think it's really a partnership that uh, can't be emph emphasized enough in its importance. Uh, so it's going to be quite rewarding for us to bring her home. Anyway, let me get on with this. This is the way she usually looks sitting at the museum. Uh, and you know, she looked pretty good there, but she was, uh, she was idle. You know, she was chained to the dock, float on her own bottom since 1973. But since about the mid 90s, uh, you know, we'd get a blow, a thunderstorm would come through and she might leak for a day or two. And a couple of years later, we'd have another thunderstorm would come through and she might leak for a week, maybe 10 days. And it finally got to a point where we knew that we had to do something drastic because it seemed to be leaking, slowing down, and then there'd be another thunderstorm and she'd start leaking again. So she was basically telling us it was time to do her bottom. And the, you know, wooden ships are constantly undergoing replacement of parts. And uh, ultimately, 100% uh, of them might be replaced. But in this regime of work, we're attacking areas of the ship that had never been rebuilt before. This, the, the bulk of the work we've done is focused on the frames of the ship. And the work that we were uncovering was the work that was done here at the Hillman Yard in uh, 1841. So why is the Morgan important? A lot of you know this. I don't want to seem redundant. Uh, but I always think it's good to give good context to why we're investing what we are in the project. It's authentic. It's the real thing. Uh, there, it's not a replica vessel. It's not an aerosol vessel. It's not a movie prop. It's the real thing. It was built. It worked. And then it retired. And it's been an important museum vessel for uh, actually longer than it was a whaling vessel. Uh, it is the oldest commercial vessel that's preserved in the United States. The Constitution, of course, is older, but she's a military vessel and has, a, had, a, has had a whole lot more resources available to continue her preservation. Uh, it really is an icon of American history. It's not just the story of New Bedford. It's not just the story of New England. The capital that was generated by whaling helped feed the Industrial Revolution, spread American enterprise around the planet. So again, she's an important symbol uh, far beyond the length of her deck or even our region. Uh, we all know, especially emphasized here in the exhibits, uh, how, that whale ships were really a... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, is there a fill here? So can you meet me out there? Hi. Dude, I thought it was me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but whale ships, the forecastles of whale ships were really microcosms of uh, the diversity that was America and internationally. A fabulous uh, melting pot, if you will. Um, the Morgan itself, because it's been preserved for so many years and so many people have put their attention on it, it's probably the best documented commercial vessel in the United States. Uh, it's a unique educational tool because it can tell all these stories. And it's not just a maritime story. It's a story that encompasses almost all of the human experience. Uh, and that, the fact that it's recognized as a National Historic Landmark kind of is a testament to that. And it's, I was found it hard in the beginning of my a career as a maritime preservationist to get my head around the concept of a vessel being a national historic landmark, but I've gotten used to it. <laughs> anyway, down, down here is an image uh, very late in her career. Uh, I don't know what voyage it was, but it, it's quite late in her operating career. So she is the last of her kind. Uh, and this comes from Judy Lund's work. That we, she's gracious, graciously shared with uh, us at Mystic Seaport. Again, to put it in context, there are about 200 years of American offshore whaling. Certainly, Native people were doing shore whaling before colonists got here, but about 200 years of going to sea in ships to chase whales. And in that time, there were 27, over 2,700 vessels that were uh, engaged in the whale fishery. And those 2,700 vessels conducted over 14,500 <laughs> voyages. And of all that human energy, all those vessels, all that work, the Morgan is the only one that remains. The image here is the Californian. California 
a great model of her upstairs that you ought to go see before. Uh, oh, what did I do wrong? Uh-oh. <laughs> how do I get out of this? <laughs> but how do I say no? <laughs> okay. Anyway, she, um, the Hillman brothers built, uh, I think it's 17 whale ships, and she was the next down the ways after the Morgan. And uh, you see what her fate was. She was broken up out in the West Coast. So again, 172 years of history when we launch her uh, next July. Uh, 1841 to 1921, active whaling vessel. From 21 to 25, her future was a little uncertain, but she was used in making three different films, uh, which again, continued. There's been a couple of vessels that find a little bit of extra money poured into them to keep them alive a little bit longer because of movies and other kinds of activity. But again, I think that helped preserve her. And then finally, uh, Whaling Enshrined, uh, principally uh, Harry Nealon and uh, his effort with uh, Colonel Green from 1925 until at least 1938. She was open as a public exhibit museum vessel uh, just down the river. And again, that, it's pretty remarkable. I, I did a little research today. I can only find two other vessels that predate her in terms of being preserved as historic craft. And uh, both of them were military vessels. One, of course, is the Constitution, and the other one is uh, the remnant of the Brig Niagara. But uh, so in 1925, it was pretty far sighted uh, for people in this town and uh, to support preserving the ship. And then, of course, in 1941, she. Uh, wound up at Mystic Seaport. And I'll leave that question mark in 1938, because we're a little uncertain as to what was her fate in terms of public access after, 1930, after the hurricane of 38. So here, far left, well, yeah, your left, uh, another beautiful image. I always like a quartering view of a vessel. I don't know, maybe it's psychologically sailing away from troubles or whatever. But uh, it's my favorite shot of a ship. There she is in Fairhaven. Uh, just awaiting her future. There she is in her glory again, uh, Round Hill, and then back at Mystic Seaport. So again, highlights of the whaling career. Keel was laid in December of 1840 at the Hillman Yard, just up the river. Launched July 21st, 1841. That's why we've chosen July 21st of this year to relaunch her. Uh, she cost about $52,000 plus to build. Her first voyage began September 6th of that same year, so uh, in roughly nine months she was built, fit out, and sailed away. Uh, I've got a couple of excuses as to why it's taken us five years to repair it, but <laughs> we can get into that later. Anyway, uh, most of her career here on the East Coast, operating out of uh, New Bedford, but uh, between 1886 and 1906 she sailed out of the West Coast. The fishery had changed, they have gone principally for bowhead whales in the Arctic, so it was more efficient operator out of San Francisco. Uh, but then in 1906, she did return, uh, having completed 37, by 1921, she had completed uh, 37 voyages, 80 years at sea. And uh, I got a couple of slides later to show some of the, the effects of 80 years at sea. Ports of call, again, we're able to retain uh, maybe 15% of the original hull. As I say, ships are always re undergoing regeneration. We figure at this point, when we started, there was about 35% of the original hull. Uh, but, but now we're quite pleased that we're able to, uh, to retain between 15 and 18%. So the keel, the keelson, principal backbone members, uh, visited all these places, sailed for 80 years. So again, it's pretty, gonna be pretty, pretty symbolic when that same keel brings her back here. Again, just as an example of the value of the whaling industry, this one vessel, uh, we've got a, a man at uh, the museum, Steve Purdy, who's got a background in economics, and rather than just using a straight uh, sort of inflation value, was using uh, quite a few different parameters to compare the 19th century value to the 21st century value, and this is some of the results. So over the course of the 19th century of her operating career, she uh, had earned a total of $1.4 million for her owners. And in 21st century value, 
that works out to be about $32.8 million. So again, one vessel was $52,000 to build, was able to generate that kind of return. So uh, pretty remarkable. She always had a reputation of being a lucky ship, even in her day. Uh, Nelson Cole Haley, what was it, the third voyage, I think, that she made, or second or third voyage he was on, describes her as a lucky ship even at that time. And I think that it really holds true even to this day. So my, you know, I was doing a little figuring as I put this together. Uh, she's actually spent more time as a preserved historic ship, 88 years now, than she did as an operating whaling vessel. 80 years is pretty remarkable for operation, but the fact that she's been a museum ship for 88 years is uh, also quite remarkable. And that, of course, starts uh, down around Hill. So in 1925, she was officially taken on by whaling enshrined in 41, she came to Mystic Seaport. 66, she was designated a National Historic Landmark. Again, only two other vessels prior, both of them military. Uh, 1973, it was decided that she would float again. When she was down around Hill, she was in a sand berth. When she first came to Mystic in 1941, she was again placed in a sand berth. But by the late 1960s, nobody had seen the structure below the water line or below the sand line. So there became some concern that she might just collapse on herself and be lost. So in the late 60s, excavations were done under the ballast around the hull, and it was found to be in remarkably good condition. And uh, at that time, our trustees, led mostly by Waldo Allen, uh, advocated for refloating the vessel so that she could be periodically taken to a facility that would enable her to be hauled out and maintained like any ship floating on her own bottom. So that was, that's what was done, and uh, in 1973, we opened the DuPont Preservation Shipyard. Uh, its principal purpose to preserve our vessels, but first task was to rebuild the Morgan to a point where she could float on her own bottom. Uh, and again, constant regeneration. So from 1979 to 1985, there was a major regime of work focused mostly on the top sides, um, and then again, in, 2000, she was recognized by the World Ship Trust as an exemplary uh, ship preservation effort. Again, the image here on the left, Colonel Greens, there she is coming through the Mystic River Bridge. Uh, the upper right there, the plaque is the National Historic Landmark designation, and then this color image is her floating after uh, having some work done to her bottom, but only enough to keep her afloat. Um, the structure, the frames and the, the bottom planking was, in, as I say, remarkably good condition. It replaced a few planks, did a lot of caulking, resheathed her, but didn't do any major restoration of the, of the below the waterline areas until this recent regime. So again, I don't, I don't think that Round Hill, Colonel Green, Whaling Enshrined, and this institution really get enough credit for the, uh, their interim stewardship, you might say, between the time she was an active vessel and by the time she came to Mystic Seaport. So I always like to uh, emphasize this in my talks. Uh, you know, I'd like to do a little more research on this area of her career myself, but of course, Colonel Green in the upper uh, left, there she is again, pretty prominent, uh, pretty common picture of her. And then, uh, doesn't show very well here, but this is some of the damage from Hurricane of 38. Interesting story about the eagle. Hurricane blew the eagle off the transom and it was later found in a marsh and returned, and uh, actually it came to, came to Mystic uh, from here after the ship was already there. So again, just another small example of the vessel's luck that her original carved eagle should be returned to. And it's still the eagle that uh, will adorn her transom right now. Right now it's in the safe storage, but it'll be going back on board when we launch her. These are some uh, images that uh, are actually, in a way, kind of sad, but these recently came to light in our collection. Uh, this is her laying in Fairhaven before making the voyage to Mystic. And I think this one here, whoop. If I roll this over, it'll become a pointer. I think this might be uh, casting the last line, uh, getting ready for that voyage to Mystic. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> you had this trouble too, didn't you? <laughs> yep, okay, coming through the Mystic Bridge. Uh, 
you can see that it meant quite a bit for the town for her to be coming there. Uh, we still have a tradition of stringing banners across the road uh, on, on the main street in town. There's a banner there today promoting uh, summer camp at one of the local churches, but uh, this is a banner that was flown the day that she arrived. It was November 8th, 1941. Again, I keep talking about ships needing constant regeneration. A few years ago when I was working on that book that was mentioned on Chesapeake Bay schooners, ran across an article in the New York Maritime Reporter. It was talking about World War I surplus ships, basically. But the title of the article was, fittingly enough, a ship's never finished till it's sunk. <laughs> and so that just stuck with me because, like I say, every day some person has to put energy into that ship to keep it preserved, to keep it alive. Sometimes as many as 28 people, which is what we've got going on the project right now. But human energy, human interaction with the artifact is necessary on a constant basis. Uh, these are just some of the highlights. For, nothing much happened in, uh, during the war. She came there in, uh, as I say, 41, but it was literally 30 days or 29 days before Pearl Harbor. Uh, so not much went on during the war. From 47 to 49, she got a new set of spars. From uh, 53 to 63, slowly, a small number of uh, shipwrights were on uh, the staff, retopping the vessel, again, just the top sides. Fresh water, of course, rots wood. Salt water preserves it, so the upper portions of the vessel, we've counted four times the top sides have been significantly rebuilt, uh, even before she became a historic vessel. As I said, she's very well documented. Log books that are here or at Mystic, insurance company records, here, some in Providence, some in Mystic. So we, we can really trace um, the history of the major work that's been done, and she's been retopped four times, but the bottom has never been addressed. So here she is in the 50s. Whoop. Damn, I'm not used to this. There she is in the 50s being retopped, and here she is uh, being floated out. And this is the work in the 70s retopping her, and now our effort uh, to put a new bottom on her. One of those tasks that are constantly ongoing are, is uh, caulking. And uh, so here's a great image. I always, I, I think I might be stretching it a little bit. I think that's 1906, not really the 19th century, but I, I saw something recently that dated that uh, image on the left is 1906. But uh, again, constant effort now spanning three centuries. And of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the capability of hauling a ship from the water. Uh, when the museum first opened the shipyard in 1973, built a vertical ship lift, uh, but it was not a very sophisticated affair. It was uh, quite adequate, lasted a good 30 years. But uh, we first began contemplating getting into this uh, degree of work on the Morgan in this regime. We had the lift dock that we had surveyed and found that, in fact, before we could do the work on the ship, we had to replace the lift dock. So we knew, as I said, as early as the mid-90s, that we were facing this uh, extent of work. But before we could do it, we had to raise the money and build the, the vertical lift. And uh, this is really state-of-the-art equipment. It's a Rolls-Royce Marine Company uh, synchro lift. And, uh, for the fragility of our historic vessels, for the uh, safety and the gentleness of hauling a, a vessel from its natural element afloat, this is about the best equipment you can get. Uh, the new equipment also gives us the opportunity to move a vessel off the lift dock platform on rail tracks, bring it ahead, and in the case of the Morgan for a long-term project, sidetrack it. That enables us to do regular maintenance, routine maintenance on the rest of our fleet while we're having a long-term project like this go on. It also has enabled us to contain any of the waste generated by ship, shipyard work, uh, effluent from power washing, paint scrapings. So none of it falls in the river anymore. We can collect it all. And uh, you know, so it becomes uh, acceptable by modern environmental standards. So the phases of this work, of course, uh, material acquisition, we, we knew we were coming up on it in the 90s. But by 2003, we had a uh, Save America's Treasures grant that enabled us to start collecting wood. Uh, and it 
I was collecting wood literally until about three months ago for this project from that time, so a whole decade of collecting material suitable for rebuilding the vessel. Uh, downrigged her and hauled her out in 08. Uh, first task, didn't for about the first year, it didn't really look like we were doing much. Because first we had a stabilizer, because we were rebuilding the bottom, we had to hold the top up. Uh, we also remediated some hog. Hog is a tendency of a wooden vessel to droop in the ends, you know, the bow and stern. There's a lot of weight, but very little buoyancy. The middle of the vessel, a lot of buoyancy pushing up. So wooden vessels tend to hog uh, over time. Let go too far, they can actually break. Uh, so we started with about 11 inches of hog, and we got down to about two inches and decided to stop. What we do is we'd come in every Monday morning, drive the wedges that were keel blocks apart till we could see light, let it sit for the week, gravity would do its thing, come back the next week, drive them apart, until finally, after about nine months of this, um, she stopped settling. So we knew that's as far as we could get her to go, so we uh, just accepted that. So she's got about two and a half inches of hog in her now, but barely perceivable. Uh, the reframing, again, was the principal thing that drove the job, uh, having to put her new, new ribs in the vessel. Uh, we've also got this uh, thing, the, the job, of course, like all of these things do, it grew considerably. Uh, one of the jobs that added significantly to the, uh, to the workload and the scope of the work was what we have dubbed the zipper effect. Again, I had those images earlier of the vessel being retopped working from the top down, they worked down to about the water line, which is the level of the tween decks, and stopped. Now we knew that we were going to be doing the bottom, so we started in the bottom, took the ceiling or inner planking out, started reframing up, got to the old work and said, wait a minute, there's a, uh, hoping this is the right direction. Nope, damn. <laughs> I should have, we brought our own, I should have used my own. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so in order to have a, a sound engineering structure, you can't have too many joints all in the same place. So when we looked at the vessel, uh, we found that we had, how did I do that? Yeah. We found that we had about 40 different frames that uh, were all butted and many of them right in a line. So what we wound up doing is having to take a lot of the outside planking that otherwise would have been sound enough to retain, take the outside planking off and reframe at that tween decks level, uh, cutting back some of the work from the 70s, cutting back some of the work that we had just completed, and then spanning that with a new piece of frame. But uh, ultimately it added, uh, I'd say, six months to the, to the job. But uh, that's now complete. Let's see if we can get it right this time. All right. Now, in terms of material acquisition, we've had a great deal of uh, good fortune, uh, some at the expense of others. Uh, you may have seen some articles about our salvaging wood from hurricanes. Starting in 1989, we became somewhat known for scavenging and salvaging live oak from down south to the point where uh, we get phone calls every time there's a major hurricane. And we make good use of the wood. Uh, live oak, of course, is the wood that gives the Constitution, the nickname Old Ironsides, the most valued shipbuilding timber uh, in the New World, in the age of wooden ships, uh, coveted by other nations, poached from our shores, first species protected by the federal government. But today, because of its aesthetic value throughout its range, it's not harvested. And it's got no commercial value except wooden shipbuilding. So um, when we get these calls, I'm usually on the plane within a few days, and uh, we salvage as much as we possibly can. So this far left image, I'm not gonna try and use the pointer. Far left image is a tree uh, with a woman in front of it. Uh, her husband had called me right after Hurricane Katrina. Again, the devastation of Katrina was so great, I didn't wanna make inquiries myself. I thought we'd let things settle down a bit. But uh, within a few weeks of the storm, I was getting phone calls. And uh, I explained that, you know, she said that they had one tree in their yard, did we want it? And I said, well, it's not really worth our coming down for one tree, you know, the transportation, the expense. And her husband gets on the phone and he says, well, you know, I'm looking at my neighbor's house. He's got seven trees leaning against his house. Now are you interested? He says sarcastically. Uh, so I said, yes. So I went down and he turns out to uh, have been an uh, anesthesiologist who was known quite well throughout the area uh, 
secured a lot of municipal help in uh, salvaging the wood. He told me one night at dinner, he said, literally, I've had my hands in every politician in this state. <laughs> <laughs> so she could, uh, or his, you know, uh, Sandra there could walk into any mayor's office along the Mississippi Gulf Coast unannounced, just throw the door open and say, you got to help this man. And they did. So we salvaged about 300 tons of wood. Then um, the single most difficult species for us to get is longleaf pine. Again, we try and approximate the quality of wood that went into the original construction, which in 1841 was old growth virgin forest. Very few trees of that size and quality left today. But we've been fortunate in being able to acquire just enough. We're just squeaking through. I think we just about wrung the south out in terms of longleaf yellow pine. But that's some really, some really significantly uh, beautiful longleaf pine on that truck there. And then the other really good fortune you may have seen something about, uh, about two years ago I got a call from a construction outfit digging a foundation for the Spalding uh, Rehabilitation Hospital up on part of what had been the Charlestown Navy Yard. I said, we got some trees here, one of my guys, some big wood here, one of my guys says it's ship timber. Why don't you come up and take a look? So I was up there literally the next day. Turns out that there had been a timber base. In the old days, they used to keep ship timber in salt water to preserve it before they'd build ships out of it. And uh, so they had a tremendous stock of material at the Charlestown Navy Yard. But by 1912, they were no longer building or repairing wooden vessels for the Navy. So they decided, well, we've got this little basin over here. We used to store timber, we'll just fill it in. So roll ahead 99 years, literally, and they're digging a foundation on this filled land and they come across this wood that had been wet in a slurry of salt water with no oxygen, literally for 99 years. And it's beautiful material. It's better material than we could get today. Uh, it was selected by master shipwrights in the era of wooden ships from virgin forests and it really was a significant boon to the project. Uh, that's what it looked like when we first got it, but uh, it did shape up and clean up pretty nicely. So here's haul out day, again, showing off our ship lift. Again, we, all the work we do, um, maritime preservation and historic preservation as a whole has evolved over time. You know, we, today we look for greater detail, greater accuracy uh, in how we present historic objects, buildings, structures, vessels. Uh, so there are uh, guidelines put out by the National Park Service that um, sort of set standards for this kind of work to do. And it prescribes replacing in kind. If you take out a certain species, try and replace that species. Um, joinery in the same form as you find. So we spent a tremendous amount of effort in researching what we were taking apart and reassembling in the same manner. Um, our, we took our document, we have one full-time documentarian on staff and he told me in the first year of the project he took 3,000 digital images and cataloged them of the work that we did. Not only that, we uh, contracted a firm called Feldman Surveyors out of Boston to use the latest state-of-the-art uh, laser cloud technology. So what you're seeing here are images of the vessel that aren't photographs, aren't digital images taken with a camera, they're measured by laser measurement to within uh, two millimeters of accuracy. So we can take this, put it in the proper software, and we can measure any element that's shown in this lower left drawing. We can see how big any one of those pieces of wood are uh, by you know, simply uh, using this fantastic little thing. Looks like a little robot standing in the middle. Uh, some of the other high-tech technology we used here was uh, digital x-raying. We, you know, the keel bolts are fundamental to the structure. Uh, but to get at them, it's quite a destructive process. So we thought we would uh, ex look into x-raying the 14-inch wide keel and uh, found that modern digital x-rays were uh, quite effective. And again, they allow us to not only get a visual image, but we can calibrate what's there. So you can see that's 1.01 inches thickness. You can see where it's reduced down to 0.82 inches 
at the very bottom. So this is the kind of evaluation and surveying we did as we went forward. So I use this to, in this scale it doesn't really show you, gotta, it's better to see it in three dimension, but on the left you can see the condition of the frames. Uh, pretty deteriorated, uh, not really doing what they need to do, and then uh, this other image on the left shows the, the new frames just before we put the ceiling back on. And again, the, the wood on the left that you're looking at was installed just up the river here at the Hillman Yard in 1841, the first time human eyes laid eyes on it uh, from the time it was first installed. But here it is now renewed. Just some great images, that's the stem, that's a piece of live oak, came from Hurricane uh, Katrina. Upper left is a sawmill that we use to cut these huge trees, some of them as much as five feet in diameter. Uh, one of the most interesting pieces of wood that went into her is a floor timber. Floor timbers are the frames that cross over the keel, they start up each side of the ship. Uh, really grown timbers, uh, that is their grown knees. You follow the grain, it's not cut out of a straight piece of wood. And that adds strength uh, to a, a wooden vessel. That piece weighed 900 pounds. It was the single largest piece of frame we put in it. Uh, there are 53 floor timbers in the ship. Uh, we only had to replace four of them, all underneath the foremast. And I think we would have been very hard pressed if not found it impossible to replace all of the floor timbers had that been necessary. We'll leave that for somebody 50 years down the line when they have to go back and do it again. But um, now fastenings, you know, a ship is really only as good as its fastenings. And um, some of the audience here has a fastening that came out of her back in the 70s. Uh, but there are three principal types of fastenings we use. We use trunnels, corruption of the word tree nail, black locust, uh, dowels that are driven very tight. You want to make them out of the driest wood you can possibly get. We cut trunnels for this project literally 10 years ago, stored them. They're as dry as air can make them. Uh, put them in a very tight hole. When you launch the ship, everything swells up. And there are trunnels in her today that were put in in 1841 that are still contributing to the strength of her bottom. Uh, then I'm going to try this one more time. Okay, up here, this is a round section spike. Uh, we use those in the butts at the ends of the planks because if you were to use a square section nail, which is more typical of a ship spike, uh, you'd have more of a tendency to split out the end of the plank. So in the ends, the the Hillman brothers used round section uh, butt spikes, which we've duplicated. And then for the run of the plank, we use these square section spikes. These are about nine sixteenths of an inch in uh, thickness and about seven and a half inches long, silicon bronze, uh, duplicating what she was originally built with. And uh, they're interspersed sort of every other frame. And they're the first fastenings that go on. They call them hanging spikes. Plank comes out of a steam box, wedge it into place, first fastened with hanging spikes, then you come back later and uh, do the trundling. A few more examples of fastenings here. Uh, and again, uh, Bill mentioned this twice in his talk about iron versus steel, that iron behaves completely differently than modern steel. There's really nobody making iron fastings uh, today at all. There's one museum in Great Britain that as a demonstration uh, at the Iron Bridge, they have some uh, iron manufacture, but it just isn't available. But uh, one of our guys had a friend in Baltimore who was a blacksmith who had acquired a tiger cage that was installed in 1908 at the Memphis City Zoo. He bought it for scrap. We turned it into, into iron fastenings. So this is uh, knees fastened with iron fastenings that came from the Memphis City Zoo. So his, uh, his keel bolts here, we, we didn't take out, as I said, it would have been destructive to take the old keel bolts out, so we sistered them, put additional keel bolts in. They're made of hardened copper. Uh, the only steel fastenings we used in her were uh, above the, well above the waterline. Everything else is either trunnel or, or non-ferrous. And that's, to a large extent, I think, why she's still here, uh, that she was fastened with the best of materials when she was first built.
planking process, uh, spile them off, uh, cut it out, steam it, and then bend it on. This uh, lo lower right image is the first plank going on. That's our uh, president, Steve White. Gave him the honor of helping to fasten the first plank. Probably have to give him the honor of fastening the last plank, which will be about two weeks from now. So again, just, oop, I guess I went the wrong way. We've seen this already, haven't we? Yes. No? Oh, OK. This is a, just a, a more detailed uh, representation of that zipper effect that I talked about. So the red uh, are the new additional frames that we weren't anticipating. And this is some of the beautiful planking we had to take off in order to access it. So caulking, again, going on constantly. Uh, today, it's out. I mean, this morning, it sounded like an old-time shipyard. We probably have four people out there caulking today as the planking is nearing its end. Uh, and then, again, magnificent piece of wood here. That's a, a knee that came out of a live oak tree from Hurricane uh, Katrina. And again, that, to get that natural shape, to follow the grain naturally from the limb of the tree is so, so infant, you know, geometrically stronger than trying to cut that shape out of a piece of straight grain timber. Uh, we, we had 10, ten, uh, ten frames, like uh, 10 knees like this in the hold of the ship. There's an old one from her up on exhibit here. Uh, but uh, again, we needed 10 of them, and we were hard pressed to get that 10th one out of all, all the material we had access to. It was really tough to get the last couple out of it. Oh, OK. So of course, while this is all going on, uh, we've got riggers. We've got three full-time riggers working, replacing standing rig, running rig, uh, making new dead eyes, making new running gear. Uh, she's got 22 spars in her rig, rigged as a bark, originally a ship. And uh, we're having to replace 14 of them. Uh, most of the spars arrived about two months ago. This is what will be the foremast which is still on the west coast, but is coming next week. And uh, we've got a great partnership with SPARS. You know, without going out there and selecting the tree them yourself, you really are not sure what you're going get, to get, because the only big stuff left for SPARS is fur from the west coast. Um, but fortunately, there's a small not-for-profit out there. I thought I corrected that spelling to G-A, any G-R-A. Anyway, Grays Harbor Historical Seaport Foundation is a uh, not-for-profit that owns a tall ship, Replica. They sail it actively, but they acquired a large lathe from uh, an electric pole company, and they use it now as a vocational training uh, tool to help young people learn woodworking skills, but they've become sort of the go-to people for spar replacement for all of the Replica and tall ships on the East Coast. Uh, that's where the Ernestina got her foremast last year. So it's a great partnership with them that it's not only serving as an, ed an educational purpose here, but out there as well. This was literally, these two were literally taken this morning, show you the condition of where we're at, uh, fairing up the planks. Um, on the, let's see, on your left is the port side. We've only got two planks left to go on that side, and we've got about five planks on the, uh, port side. So within the next two weeks, we'll, we'll have that wrapped up. We're going to put two more in tomorrow. So again, uh, just to show some of the things that we discovered, the little details. You know, again, this is the first time the ship was taken apart in this area. Um, and I'll risk the pointer again. But again, the quest for good material went on even back then. You see this piece here? That's what we call a graving piece or a Dutchman. There was a fault in this plank in 1841. And rather than discard it, they simply cut out the bad spot and added a new spot. Acceptable practice in a work boat. Coast Guard wouldn't let you do it on an inspected vessel today. Uh, and it wouldn't meet classification society standards, you know, ABS, Lloyds, any of these uh, groups that um, classify vessels for insurance purposes, underwriting purposes. You couldn't do this kind of thing. Same thing with this frame. This frame probably had bark on it when they put it in there. And again, it wouldn't be acceptable to a modern um, wooden boat or shipbuilder 
but apparently it was good enough to last 172 years. So, <laughs> and a couple other things. Uh, there's another little graving piece of, of fault in th this plank. So the, this is all on the inside. It couldn't have been done from the outside. It had to be done to that plank before it was applied to the ship. And in here, uh, this is a plank. Some of the planks on the bottom we had to replace, not because they were rotten, but because they were worn out. This, a frame sat here, and a frame sat here, and this was the space between frames. And 80 years at sea, way bilge water sloshing back and forth, had reduced it by about 40% of its thickness. So rule of thumb is if anything's reduced more than 25%, it's got to be replaced. So uh, that's wooden vessels, steel vessels. It's kind of a rule of thumb for inspection. But uh, so they, again, that was quite remarkable that it, you know, th and that plank is three inches thick, or three and a half inches thick. The inside ceiling is three and a, is three. The outer planking is three and a half. So just some of the little details that we really enjoyed discovering. So overall, the project represents uh, six point nine million dollars. 67 months of duration. Right now we're at the peak of our employment. We've got 28 full-time people on the project, and that doesn't count the riggers. We've got, so there's actually 31. Uh, we hauled her out in November we'll, of 08. We'll launch her this July, and then in June of 14, we'll depart and bring her here. Hmm. Okay. We're also uh, gonna put a whole new suit of sails on her. Uh, we're making the sales out of cotton that Matt Wilson up in Booth Bay, Harbor, Maine, uh, specializes in traditional sales. Started as a sailmaker at Mystic Seaport. Uh, but he has uh, vendors in the UK that will weave sailcloth just as it was done in the 19th century, panel widths out of the same cotton uh, fibers. So these sales, while very few of us will be able to perceive the degree of accuracy. I just want, want you to know that this is the extent that we go to at Mystic Seaport to achieve that degree of authenticity in our work. So overall, some of the work we've done, there were 288 pieces of frame. Each section of frame is called a futtock. Uh, an assemblage of futtocks is a frame. Uh, 280 pieces of frame, four floor timbers, 17 feet of keelson, the sort of mirrors the keel on the inside of the hull. Uh, we had to rebuild the transom, which was unexpected, unanticipated rather. We had to put a new stem and apron in her. Uh, wound up reframing the bow. 70 ceiling planks, which is all of the ceiling planks, except some of the work that was done in the 80s all the way forward. Uh, there's probably gonna be about 153 hull planks by the time we're all done. 10 knees, 14 spars, new blocks, new standing and running rig, and new sails. So you get quite a bit for $6.9 million. <laughs> Remaining uh, will be finished just about on schedule there with the planking. Uh, we've got her in a big plastic tent right now, the frame of which serves as our scaffolding. That'll be coming down in uh, late May. We'll move her out from where she is to the lift dock, and um, we'll lower her down a little bit uh, to start to swell her up but we won't let her float. Uh, we'll save that for the actual launch in July. And uh, after she's back in the water, we'll let her sort of feel her own shape again, readjust to being afloat, weight distribution, swelling, uh, before we put the rig in her. Uh, for this voyage, we're gonna be installing some systems uh, just to keep it safe, you know, bilge pumps, fire pumps, things like that, most of which will come out after we return. Uh, We'll be rigging her through next winter. In the spring, we'll finish ballasting her. We're gonna do a full, uh, those of you who know something about naval architecture, an inclining experiment to determine her stability, uh, just as if she was a modern vessel, but it'll also be uh, a good education in terms of knowing what the parameters of stability of a whale ship hull are. This work's never been done before. Um, and then we'll leave Mystic on the 17th of July. We just changed, uh, 17th of May and 14th. We just changed that this week. We had it scheduled for the 16th, because the tide looked right. Then I looked at a calendar and then found out that Friday, that May 16th in 2014 was a Friday. So you never begin a voyage on a Friday. So uh, 
ask any fisherman down the docks here. So uh, three months equates to 66 working days, not that we're counting, uh, before we actually launch her, 292 working days before we depart. Again, I said lucky ship. This is, there's a lot of text here, but suffer through it with me, if you will. 80 years of active service at sea, that's quite a risk in itself. She survived unscathed. There's a great story in this Nelson Cole Haley's book about narrowly escaping being cast ashore in what is today uh, Kiribati, formerly the Gilbert Islands. Uh, she avoided the Confederate raiders and the devastation they wrought on the whale uh, fleet during the Civil War. She wasn't taken as part of the Stone Fleet to try and blockade the harbors in the south. She avoided the major catastrophes of vessels freezing in in the uh, Bering Sea. Uh, her sister, Emily Morgan, did not. Uh, she avoided all the dangers of World War I. There's a great story in one of her logs about watching a mine float by. Vessels completely becalmed, completely at the mercy of whatever natural elements there are. And this mine floats by merely feet off the side of the hull. Uh, lower image here is her laying at Fairhaven in 1924. Vessel caught fire, broke lo loose, wound up alongside. Fire department put the fire out, saved the ship. And this is again before she uh, went to Colonel Green's. Again, that's a great stroke of luck in itself, just that Whaling enshrined and Colonel Green took it on. Uh, she survived the hurricane at 38, in a rather exposed position. Again, a tremendous evidence of good luck. Came to Mystic literally weeks before Pearl Harbor, and then Mystic Seaport's been willing to pour literally millions of dollars into her over the last uh, 72 years. So, personally, I was at first against the idea of sailing it. Of course, it was great to think about bringing her back here, but uh, from a preservation point of view, I was afraid we'd have to replace more wood to make her seaworthy than good preservation ethic would demand. But once we got that ceiling out, we could see the condition of the frames, then we realized that the, wor the extent of work was so great that we wouldn't be compromising any uh, parameters of historic preservation that just to go back to the dock, we had to do as much work as we did uh, to, to be a static exhibit. So with that, she's going to be in as good, if not better shape, than she was on her last whaling voyage back in 1921. So then I became a believer. So this is our intended route. OK, got it. Uh, we can only get about 12 and a half feet out of the Mystic River in terms of draft. It's just too shallow. She'll float with her full rig in her and about half her ballast at that uh, draft. So we'll bring her out on a high tide at about 12 and a half feet and take her to New London. Just yesterday, we met with the city council and got permission to bring her to the city pier. We will finish the ballasting. She'll need about another, she'll draw probably about 13 and a half, maybe four, closer to 14 by the time we get her fully ballasted. Then we'll sea trial her out of New London, shake her down a little bit, take her to Newport because it's a nice, easy day sail to Newport uh, from Mystic, lay there for a day or two, then go out to uh, Vineyard Haven. A lot of history between the ship and Vineyard Haven. Her first captain was from the island. 14 of her first crew were from there. Uh, we've got great support from the island. Matthew's from the island. So uh, that'll be her port of call. And then we'll bring her from there up to New Bedford, she'll, which will be the focus of her voyage. In fact, she'll spend uh, about 10 days here. Um, all kinds of celebrations and cooperation with uh, this museum in the planning stages. Frankly, I worry about getting the ship there. I'm letting other people worry about what happens once she's here. <laughs> uh, then back through the Cape Cod Canal, we'll lay at the Maritime uh, Academy overnight, then go on to Provincetown. Her last voyage, she was actually registered out of Provincetown. I don't think she went there, but she was registered there. Uh, and that'll give us a good position to take her out to Stellwagen Bank, National Maritime, uh, I mean, National Marine Sanctuary, uh, Whale Sanctuary. We'll take her out there, sail, do some research. Uh, we've got a, a college-level um, marine program associated with Mystic Seaport. 
just today we were talking about some of the uh, experiments we'll do with bottom fouling uh, between the Mystic River and Open Sea. Spent about three days uh, day sailing out of Provincetown to Stellwagen. Go to Boston, where we'll pay homage to the Constitution, oldest military vessel, oldest civilian vessel, side by side. And then we'll just retrace our steps back to Mystic. Uh, at this point, we don't have any plans for any future voyaging, but who knows? Accompanying the ship uh, is going to be a tug, 800 horsepower tugboat named Tubin, owned by uh, Ralph Packer on uh, Moss's Vineyard. He's committed to going every step of the way with us. Uh, we've got our own eastern rig dragger, Roanne, 500 horsepower. She'll be uh, an auxiliary vessel helping uh, where necessary. And then uh, we've got this uh, large inflatable uh, that we'll take along as well. And then we're going to invite yacht clubs and anyone who wants to join the flotilla, basically. I think there'll be something pretty well organized when we arrive here. So the outfitting that we're doing, we'll temporarily put some systems in her. Uh, the vessel is not going to be done to any modern regulatory standard, no Coast Guard involved. She'll be sailed as an uninspected vessel. Um, we've already worked that out with the Coast Guard before we ever announced that we'd be taking her sailing. There'll be no mechanical propulsion for the vessel. Uh, itself, there will be a, a generator for safety. Uh, no subdivision bulkheads, which any modern vessel of her size would demand. Uh, systems, we'll put an electrical system in her because the electric system in her probably dates to 1941 and it just needs to be replaced anyway. Bilge pumping, firefighting, we have to make some concession to the crew that'll be on board and put domestic plumbing in. Uh, navigation gear, again, just prudent seamanship demands. We have navigation equipment and of course, life-saving equipment. When it came to outfitting, I found this Ashley uh, painting online. Uh, and then, of course, this is the whaleboat project, and uh, Bill did a pretty good job describing the vessel that's uh, being built through this organization at uh, Beetle. But uh, our president, Steve White, kind of had this idea of, like Tom Sawyer, you know, Maybe we can focus on the ship and we can get other organizations interested in building the whaleboats. And I, I look pretty cynically at it, but uh, in fact, it's been quite successful. Not only here, but uh, these, are, these other organizations are uh, also participating, many of which uh, have also been aided by the same uh, donor who everybody knows, but is sometimes referred to as the anonymous donor. But uh, anyway, uh, Independent Seaport, Philadelphia, Maritime Museum, Rocking the Boat, which is an after-school activity down in uh, New York, teaching kids uh, boat building and life skills. Lowell's Boat Shop up in Amesbury, The Apprentice Shop up in Rockport, Beetle here, Cannon Benjamin out in Martha's Vineyard, Great Lakes Boat Building School. Uh, they found out about it at the Wooden Boat Show last year and decided they wanted to sign on. Alexandria Seaport Foundation, Again, another boat building program in Alexandria, Virginia. Wooden Boat Factory, which is another boat building educational entity in Philly working in conjunction with Independent Seaport. It's actually being, the boat that they're building is being built at the Philadelphia Maritime Museum, but uh, different people. And then uh, just recently, the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum has signed on as well. So there'll be a total of 10 new whale boats uh, added to the uh, fleet uh, all around this project. So that gives us great opportunities for whaleboat programming in not just here, but in other ports as well. Uh, thought I could get through without, yeah, right back to the beginning. I, I don't remember what the last one is. But <laughs> Okay, again, uh, specialized door locks for the, uh, for the projects. It's one of them being, we're, because as, as Bill pointed out, some of the metal work is very specialized. We've got patterns that we've built over the years because we've built quite a number of whale boats. And uh, so we've agreed that for the boats that are building elsewhere, we'll provide some of that specialized work. This is one of the door locks being built. I think there's one more. 
Okay, that's the last slide. That's uh, John uh, Levitt painting of the vessel sailing. Uh, the only color image of the vessel under sail is in art. There's a couple of other uh, artistic depictions of the vessel. But uh, so hopefully, about 14 months from now, that's what we'll be seeing. So that's it. I hope I haven't bored you too much. Thanks very much. Thanks, Quentin. Um, we've got a few minutes if anyone wants to ask questions of any of our three speakers. So, uh, I think this gentleman. That uh, storm damaged trees that were initiated in the set of trees is a pretty little well gnarled and grotesque. Uh, did you use it? Uh, we used parts of the top of it. That tree, you know, live oak trees can get very big, and sometimes there are clusters of trees growing very close together. And the, in the space that allows water to intrude between them, often there's deterioration. So we didn't use the main trunk, but some of the upper branches, I think one of the upper branches turned into one of the 10 knees that was in the hole. So again, when you look at a tree like that, about 15% of it winds up ship. The rest of it winds up smaller boats, <laughs> firewood, Landfill. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you're going to sail the boat. Yep. When do you start? How many crew members and when do you start training? Okay. How long will that take? Us? We hope to uh, select a captain from the fleet of tall ships that's out there. We've got a number of people interested, probably by Labor Day. Um, by next, early next winter, we'll start to make commitments to crew. Um, the vessel will leave Mystic, as I say, the 17th of May. We'll take it into London, shake her down. The crew will probably be on by the 1st of April at the very latest, uh, doing drills at the dock and learning the peculiarities of this individual rig. Way in the back. I understand how you're getting the boat to New Bedford. How do you expect to get her out of New Bedford? <laughs> I kind of suspected I'd be asked that question. <laughs> Goodwill, let's put it that way. <laughs> yes? Um, when, are you guys, when are you going out to uh, stop by tonight, you're going to lower the other boats away? Yeah, that's the intent. All yeah. right. Yeah. There's going to be some training involved beforehand. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's still up in the air. You know, the way I look at it, it's kind of like what Willie Hutton said about Robin Banks. You know, that's where the money is. <laughs> yeah. Well, she carried about 35 people in her crew. Again, whaling ships carried many more uh, individuals than a merchant vessel of similar tonnage because of the specialized trades involved and in manning the boats. Uh, so we've convinced the Coast Guard that we can safely carry 49 persons on board. So that's what we'll be aiming for. What does the distance sail cost? 116 thousand dollars. 22 sails. <laughs> yes, absolutely we intend to sail it. We want a tugboat with us at all times uh, for safety's sake. But it is our intent to move her as much as possible uh, on our own sail power. Well, we've, we've actually we do have a naval architectural firm that uh, is working with us for. I've got a half-time naval architect on our staff, um, but we are working with an outfit called JMS, uh, Jamestown Marine Services, internationally known. Uh, Marine engineering salvage firm. They do a lot of stability work on passenger vessels, and we're working with them on uh, all of those aspects of the, the, how much sail she can carry when. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Charles Wall Morgan was a Quaker from Philadelphia who married into one of the prominent whaling families in New Bedford 
and became himself uh, one of the barons of the whaling industry in that era. Uh, Matthew could probably tell you more detail about him, but um, owned shares in a number of ships and was the principal owner, had half of this vessel. Uh, story goes that uh, he was away when it came time to name the ship and his uh, nephew named it after him. He wasn't very pleased with it, but uh, decided to let it ride. But it has, has been good luck for the vessel, obviously. Oh, really? No. Yeah, we've got a, an organization of descendants that we stay in contact with, uh, come to the museum on various occasions. Uh, yeah. Anybody else? What's, what's your biggest concern about the voyage? Weather. <laughs> <laughs> Our intent is to leave late enough to be past much of the spring weather and get back before the bulk of tropical weather starts to head this way. Uh, so we, we hope to be back by the end of the first week in August. Well, I, I was reading uh, in Levitt's book that she was once recorded doing nine knots. Uh, I don't think we're, gonna, we're not gonna press her hard enough to do that because it still is the original keel and some of the bottom frames. Uh, we're figuring we'll average over the bottom about four knots for our planning purposes. Uh, hopefully we'll get it to five or six under sail downwind. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, I, we haven't really done any calculation on what the theoretical hull speed would be. She's a lot finer under the water than her, her form might be lie. You know, you look at her and she looks like she's bluffed out, but she really gets pretty fine under the water. Well, of course, in her day, it would have been just beach cobbles piled around the keelson and then uh, stores and equipment out and fresh water outbound and hopefully whale oil inbound. Uh, we're going to be using a combination of lead, concrete block, and water ballast. Uh, we don't want to use all lead because it'll give her too quick a motion and strain the rig. Uh, so we want to gradually, uh, we want a, a motion that's comfortable for the ship, but still safe from a stability perspective. One of the reasons we want to use a lot of uh, water ballast is uh, in case we need to discharge any of it in a hurry, if you know what I mean. Way in the back, I don't know how much longer you want to go. I'll, I'll go all night. Uh, I look forward to seeing her in the but I sure hope you'll keep the table away from her. Oh yeah, we'll, you know, Believe me, uh, making this as visually attractive as possible is going to be uh, paramount in our overall scheme. But we uh, we do want a fast inflatable as a rescue boat. You know, I mean, it's a required. In terms of how we're outfitting her, even though she's not going to be an inspected vessel and governed by the Coast Guard uh, when she's underway, she will be governed by the Coast Guard when she's alongside. She'll be what they call a dockside attraction vessel. Um, but we do plan to fit her out, equip her with safety equipment and all of the other accoutrements of a modern vessel as if she were an inspected vessel because it's just the only prudent thing to do with priceless artifact. You know. Last one. Uh, the rigging, uh, are you using stainless steel coated, I mean wrapped or original? No, we're, uh, we're using uh, galvanized plow steel, which is what you would have had in the late era. It just, again, I could go on all night if you can. Um, we don't represent her in the 1841 configuration because there's no, no evidence of what she looked like. We represent her in a sort of 1895 to 1910 era. Uh, at that time, she had wire standing rig uh, because that's when we've got the best credible evidence. We can make her the most authentic by representing her in that period.
So she'll have wire standing rig, but she will have uh, vanilla running gear. Forty-nine total persons. Yeah. Uh, no, she's um, not everybody will be staying aboard, but she's got twenty-two berths in the forecastle. Uh, she, these, she's got at least thirty-six berths in her. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Come to Michigan.